this first panel looking at the shifting military balance in East Asia and some of the strategic choices facing the United States, Japan, um, and China in particular. You know, the military balance issue itself is a whole separate field of study. Um, but if I were to think of my own headlines based on military developments in this region, many are talking about the sequestration and the impact on the United States and the U.S. ability to rebalance and pivot uh, to Asia Pacific. So for instance, Chief of Naval Operations Admiral Greenard is concerned that sequestered Navy will uh, essentially mean that at the end of this decade, the United States would even, if we do pivot a percentage of forces to Asia Pacific, wouldn't have any more forces there in 2020 than we do today in effect. Meanwhile, Japan is actively talking about being a proactive contributor on defense and security, but in reality, there's not going to be some huge increase in the budget. Even the changes they're talking about are within the framework of the peace constitution and therefore still below the threshold of what other countries are doing on collective self-defense. Um, China is modernizing more rapidly, but they have a long way to go. And many studies have said they're lagging far behind. So the military issues themselves are not necessarily driving uh, this uh, particular issue, but they are in the background uh, a concern about where this trend will be in the next decade, including <coughs> law enforcement and Coast Guard forces. So really we want to get deeper into the political aims. Of what, what is the role that these military, paramilitary forces uh, are going to play? What's the dynamic and clash among them? How are these countries expected to leverage military power in a place like the East China Sea and, and more broadly in the region for the political objectives they seek? And that's why we put together this uh, group of experts. And I want to start with my uh, former colleague and good friend, Dr. James Pristop from the National Defense University to speak from really a U.S. perspective. Jim. Thanks. <clears throat> thanks, Patrick. <clears throat> and thanks for the invitation to be here this morning. Uh, this is a very interesting time to be talking about developments in the um, Asia Pacific region. Uh, this morning, I want to take a brief and broad overview of the region, focusing on national interests and strategic imperatives. From my perspective, for the United States, Japan, and China, it's all about access and presence or not. For the United States, going back to the early days of the Republic, commerce and access to the markets of Asia have been enduring national interests. The opening, the opening of Japan or to Japan was in part related to the protection of US merchantmen engaged in commerce with China. The open door in China was initially all about securing access to the markets of China. Other interests include freedom of navigation as the means to access markets, maintaining a stable balance of power. Post-World War I era, that was the Washington Conference System. And in the post-World War II period, uh, this has been focused on the bilateral alliance structure involving U.S. forward presence and commitment to the security and defense of alliance partners. The ability to access the region is critical to, the, to allowing the U.S. to meet alliance commitments. Recall Secretary Gates' 2010 QDR charge to the U.S. military to be able to fight and prevail in an anti-access environment, and President Obama's 2012 defense strategy guidance that calls attention to China and Iran's asymmetric efforts to counter U.S. power projection capabilities. In this context, the pivot now the rebalance is, in essence, a reassertion of U.S. United States interests, economic, political, diplomatic, and security in the Asia-Pacific region, of its intent to maintain and to advance them, to reassure U.S. allies and partners, all, face, all based on the concepts of access and presence. And the United States has consistently opposed efforts to exclude it from the region. President Mahathir's EAEC, the East Asian Economic Community, um, that as a result resulted in APEC, which included the U.S. in the Asia Pacific region, and, and also in terms of the uh, initial structure of the EAS. This is something that we opposed because we were not part of it. For the United States, the concepts of access, inclusion, and presence have been and remain today at the core of its strategic approach to Asia and essential to the realization of its national interest. I want to just touch briefly, Patrick, on Japan and China in this context as well. 
for over half a century, the alliance with the United for Japan. For over half a century, the alliance with the United States has served as the cornerstone of Japan's foreign policy and national security strategy. Alternatives have been considered. Swiss-like neutrality was trendy for a while, but never really gained traction. Multilateralism had its day in terms of the Higuchi uh, re Commission report. And despite the Cassandra-like warnings from Beijing, Japan is not moving back to a unilateralist, remilitarized 1930s future. The alliance remains Japan's default security option, allowing Japan to avoid isolation, maintain a minimal defense force, and protect its core interests, both with respect to the defense of Japan, as well as regional and global interests. Prime Minister Abe based his five, five new principles for Japanese diplomacy on Japan's historic interests. He defined them first as eternally keeping Asia's seas open, free, and peaceful, where the rule of law is fully realized, and second, the alliance with the United States. Recently, during an upper house uh, uh, budget committee earlier this week, the prime minister, in response to a question about the background behind the proactive pacifism, replied that in both the East China Sea and the South China Sea, there have been moves to challenge the status quo with force. The seas must be open. Freedom of, uh, freedom of navigation must be observed. In the South China Sea, Japan's strategic use of ODA to enhance maritime capabilities in Southeast Asia has served to strengthen national resilience. And China's challenge to the U.S. assertion of freedom of navigation, as in the impeccable incident, stands as a challenge to access and enduring national interests. Freedom of navigation across the region is a shared alliance interest. With regard to the Senkakus, the United States has repeatedly made clear that the alliance extends to areas under Japan's administrative control. But ultimately, confidence in the alliance is based on the credibility of the United States to honor its security commitments. In large part, this is dependent on the U.S. ability to reassure Japan, to secure and maintain access to and presence in Japan in light of growing anti-access area denial capabilities. Now, finally, to China. In July 2009, State Councilor Dai Bingguo identified three core interests of China, maintenance of its fundamental system and state security, state sovereignty and territorial integrity, and the continued development of China's economy and society. Today, however, China's increasingly assertive behavior in the East China Sea and South China Sea has raised questions as to whether China, as China's power grows, we are or will be witnessing an expansion of Beijing's definition of its core interests. To date, in terms of territorial integrity, Chinese officials have focused only on Taiwan, Tibet, and Xinjiang. And Taiwan is the only area not under Beijing's control. To deal with the possible Taiwan contingency, and in this context to protect China's <coughs> industrial and commercial centers on its coast, Beijing has invested heavily in the development of counter-intervention or anti-access area denial capabilities. Extending China's defense perimeter into the Pacific Ocean could challenge enduring U.S. interests in access and among allies raise questions about the U.S. ability to meet alliance commitments. This gets us back to Secretary Gates' challenge to the U.S. military to be able to fight and prevail in an anti-access environment. Looking ahead, the central question to be resolved is whether China will accept the United States in the words of the January 2011 joint statement as a country that contributes to peace and stability in the region, or will it see the U.S. in the bilateral alliance structure as the foundation of regional stability and its security and its own prosperity, or will, it seem, or will it see the alliance structure as aimed at containing China? Just a final thought, and not related to Japan, China or the maritime dimension on the Korean Peninsula. For over a century, the Korean Peninsula has been a significant driver in the strategic calculus of Japan, the United States, and China. And since the end of the Korean War, China has maintained North Korea as a strategic buffer against the ROK in the United States. The question now for consideration, is it possible that China's vision today may be expanding? to a broader concept of the peninsula itself as a strategic buffer as it moves positive, positively to engage the ROK as a result of the 
Xi Park Summit, the China-Korea FDA, the enhanced strategic dialogues that have been agreed to. I think this is something we have to keep in mind as we consider the evolution of the strategic environment in Northeast Asia. Thanks, Patrick. Jim, thank you very much. You've raised a lot of questions, and there are still a lot of issues that uh, can come up in uh, the subsequent uh, discussion, especially about U.S. policy, the degree of ambiguity, for instance, regarding its security commitments uh, in this region uh, as it considers trying to resist changes to the status quo, whatever that might be, and maybe Bonnie Glazer will get into that. But first, uh, Tetsuo Katani, uh, my partner in crime in terms of helping to organize today's uh, conference and an old friend. Uh, one of the rising young stars in Japan on security studies. I want to turn to Katani-san to talk from a Japanese perspective about these issues. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, as uh, one of the co-organizers of this event, uh, let me thank CNES for your cooperation, and uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, I will provide a bigger picture of what's going on in the East Asian waters, and then I will talk about uh, the current situation in this uh, East China Sea and the uh, Senkaku uh, Islands. Um, the, the stability in Asia has rested on the balance between the uh, maritime powers and the continental powers. U.S. and Japan provided uh, maritime power to uh, secure the freedom of the seas in the Western Pacific, and Russia, China, India dominated the, the Asian continent. And there was a uh, uh, balance between the two camps, and then the stability in Asia has long been kept. But the, the more recently, the, because of the Chinese development of anti-access capabilities in the Western Pacific, this balance uh, is now being challenged. Um, A2AD is an American term, and the Chinese don't use the term A2AD. Chinese call it uh, counter-intervention capabilities. Uh, but what, whichever uh, term you use, the, the primary anti-axis uh, uh, weapons are a large submarine fleet and anti-ship cruise missiles. But those two capabilities require a wide range of ocean surveillance to, de uh, to detect and target the enemy forces. And here, China faces a fundamental problem because of its uh, primitive uh, surveillance capabilities. So China has been trying to expand its ISR capabilities in the Western Pacific. So for example, China uh, has been conducting maritime, survey, uh, maritime scientific research in the East China Sea. Uh, of course, one of the objectives is to identify and locate seabed resources in the, in the East China Sea. At the same time, they can uh, <coughs> map the seabed for submarine uh, operations. And our Coast Guard has identified some Chinese fishing boats uh, equipped with uh, surveillance uh, equipments. So fishing boats, Chinese fishing boats in the East China Sea are uh, also uh, involved in the surveillance uh, operations. Um, but at the same time, China needs to deny other countries' surveillance activities in China's uh, EEZ. So uh, we had an EP3 incident in 2001, and we had a USNS impeccable case in 2009. So what's going on in the East Asian waters is not only about the territorial nationalism or resource nationalism, but behind it, we have a strategic uh, issue. And I think we have to understand that uh, to have a, a better picture of it. And in China has a, a clearer picture in the South China Sea than in the East China Sea. Because China has occupied certain land features in the South China Sea and put uh, military facilities in those uh, features, they can have uh, better surveillance activities in the South China Sea. But the, the situation in the East China Sea is totally different. First of all, there are a very limited number of islands in the East China Sea. Uh, and except uh, the Senkaku Islands, uh, there's no land feature 
uh, where you, you can put uh, uh, radar or other surveillance uh, equipments. And, but, same t uh, but on the other hand, US and Japan have a, a better situational awareness in the East China Sea. We basically understand uh, what is going on in the East China Sea or which, uh, what kind of ships or aircraft are in the East China Sea uh, area. So uh, basically, for the US and Japan, uh, the, <clears throat> the number one issue is to keep our superiority in the ISR capability in the East China Sea uh, so that we can maintain the military balance that favors US and Japan. Um, but uh, we are still not sure whether we can maintain a better military balance, say in 10 years or in 15 years, China may develop more sophisticated capabilities and change the military balance. So uh, at the same, uh, on one hand, our task is to keep our ISR capabilities and military capabilities better than China. But at the same time, we have to seek uh, deeper uh, engagement with China to avoid uh, miscalculation, accidents, or escalation. And uh, here, I have an issue. Uh, you know, I think we all agree that the, we have to establish certain form of uh, crisis management mechanism with China. But at the same time, we have to be reminded that the, the establishment of such a mechanism is not a magic solution to the problem. Um, you know, between US and China, you have uh, MMCA, but uh, MMCA didn't prevent impeccable or EP3 incident. Uh, I see the fundamental problem is is that China doesn't uh, observe the international rules, international norms, and international regulations uh, while they are a part of it. So the, the crisis me uh, management mechanism should not be our objective, but it, is, it should be a way, a means, to uh, persuade China to observe the international rules. And finally, on the Senkaku issue, um, I, I think the Senkaku issue is not about the past. It is not about history, but it is about the future of Asia. You know, how we handle this issue will uh, you know, decide the future of Asia. I think uh, that's a uh, very important one. I important point. Well, uh, we, you know, Japanese think there is no legal ground under the Chinese claims over the Senkaku Islands. Uh, although China says they discovered the island in the 19th, uh, in 15th century, but I think China discovered Senkaku Islands in 1971 when Taipei suddenly uh, claimed the Senkaku. So, you know, this is a very new issue, but at the same time, you cannot create a legal dispute by making accusation or sending ships and aircraft to the area which is under other countries' uh, uh, control. I understand some Americans think Japan should admit the existence of legal uh, dispute because China demands it. But if Japan does it, I think that will undermine the liberal international order. We should not give rewards to bad behavior. So I think uh, uh, you know, Prime Minister Abe's position is correct. We will uh, not admit the existence of dispute, but the, the doors are always open for uh, dialogue. Um, 
uh, China also demands the shelving the issue or, or postponing the issue. But I don't think this will uh, provide a good solution to the problem. Because you know, shelving the issue uh, basically means uh, China wants to buy time until the military balance favors China. So uh, um, I think uh, we have to maintain our military balance, uh, our uh, sophisticated military forces while uh, deepening our engagement with China. And we have to persuade China to obey the international uh, regulations and rules. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Tetsuo-san, thank you very much. Uh, today's forum is obviously very much a dialogue of uh, the United States and Japan on these issues, but it's, uh, it can't happen without discussing China. <laughs> Um, I don't know anybody uh, here in Washington, at least, who has the pulse of uh, China better than Bonnie Glazer at uh, CSIS, and we've asked her to try to help us start to think about China's aims and what they're doing here, because there, there's a disconnect between, on the one hand, U.S. strategic guidance saying we need to fight and prevail against anti-access, which is kind of the big war uh, scenario, which doesn't seem in the offing, versus the uh, what Kotani-san just mentioned in terms of uh, really just trying to nudge Japan and nudge U.S. to pressure Japan to acknowledge a dispute so that they can have a better environment in which to wield influence. But let's turn to Bonnie uh, to help us think about this. Thank you so much, uh, Patrick, and thank you to uh, CNAS for the invitation uh, to speak today. Uh, I begin when examining China's strategy in the East China Sea by looking at, at it in the context of China's broader uh, maritime strategy. The way that Chinese themselves define this is a strategy of uh, peaceful coexistence, deterrence, active defense, um, and also counter-intervention, uh, which Kotani-san has uh, talked about. Now, I won't go into the strategy in great detail due to the limits of time, uh, but I think it is um, it, it begins certainly with controlling uh, the waters within the first island chain uh, that links uh, Okinawa, Taiwan, and uh, the Philippines. Uh, the Chinese seek to uh, essentially, as uh, Swinzo would say, uh, to win without fighting. Uh, the Chinese want to avoid military confrontation while achieving uh, their strategic objectives. Uh, they also seek beyond the first island chain to uh, control over a longer period of time, I believe, the waters within uh, the second island chain. And of course, China is developing a range of capabilities, as uh, Kotani-san talked about, that is aimed at making it highly risky uh, for the United States in a crisis uh, to gain access and operate uh, within China's near seas, the East China Sea being one of those seas and the others being the Yellow mm -hmm. Sea and uh, the South China Sea. Now, what China's ambitions are uh, beyond this, sort of longer term, I think, uh, are, are unclear. Uh, but I think that it, it is helpful uh, to go back to 1982, when then Vice Chairman of the Central Military Commission, Liu Huaqing, outlined a three-stage uh, naval plan uh, for China. And the first uh, phase of that plan was essentially gaining control of uh, the waters within the first island chain. Then the second stage uh, was gaining uh, control of waters within the second island chain. And then beyond that, the third stage is 2020 to 2040. And uh, that posited uh, that China would put an end to U.S. military dominance, uh, not only in the Pacific, but also in the Indian Oceans. Now, today, the Chinese government uh, insists that it does not seek to expel the United States from the region. Uh, at least that is China's statement today. Um, it remains to be seen whether uh, this plan has any significance, any operational value for Beijing's uh, ambitions uh, in the future. Uh, Jim Pristip referred to China's uh, core interests, and I did want to mention that I think that the best definition of China's core interests, the, uh, perhaps even more authoritative than the one that you cite, is the one that was uh, outlined in the Chinese Defense White Paper in 2011. Um, and in that white paper, there are five components of China's core interests. And I would call your attention to one of them, which is national security, which is indeed a potentially very expansive definition uh, of China's core interests. 
So China's naval and air platforms now operate frequently, uh, as we know, in waters around Japan, conducting training exercises as well as surveillance and intelligence missions. Uh, PLA naval flotillas are using uh, very diverse routes through the East China Sea to the Pacific Ocean, um, and they pass through, of course, Japan's EEZs regularly. Most of these operations are conducted safely and professionally, uh, but there are, of course, notable exceptions, and those include the use of fire control radar by Chinese ships against Japanese targets earlier this year, and occasional flights by military aircraft and civilian aircraft in uh, Japan's airspace. The Chinese government's coordination of the activities of its law enforcement vessels, as well as coordination between PLAN and civilian ships has improved significantly over the past year. Uh, warships operate at a great distance from Coast Guard patrols, and I would say that they are unlikely to be employed unless Japan were to use its naval vessels to expel Chinese civilian ships uh, from the area. Uh, if there is an opportunity, um, then I think that the Chinese will seize on it. And if we look at China's strategy, whether it's in the South China Sea or in the East China Sea, I think opportunistic is certainly a word that characterizes uh, what the Chinese are doing, where opportunities present themselves, whether it's by the purchase of the islands by the Japanese government in September 2012, or if the Philippines' mistakes in the Scarborough Shoal, they have uh, seized on those opportunities to turn the strategic situation to their uh, advantage. Um, prior to the purchase of the islands uh, by the Japanese government, three of the five islands, of course, uh, China had entered the 12 nautical, nautical uh, mile territorial water of the, uh, around the islands four times. The first uh, was in December of 2008. Of course, now we see Chinese patrols um, almost weekly um, within those territorial waters. Uh, they have effectively challenged Japan's administrative control over the islands. Uh, and Beijing seeks to use this new status quo to pressure Tokyo uh, to admit the existence of a territorial dispute. At the onset of this crisis in September 2012, Xi Jinping was appointed head of uh, an ad hoc response, a crisis response group. This was, of course, even before he became secretary general of the Chinese Communist Party. And it is likely that Xi's handling of this issue has helped him to win support in the Chinese military and boosted his domestic uh, legitimacy. And for these reasons, I think it will be very difficult for Xi Jinping to make concessions on the islands unless Tokyo acts first. In any case, um, China is not likely to return to the status quo ante. Now, how has China viewed U.S. policy toward the East China Sea and the expansion of U.S.-Japan military cooperation? I think that the Chinese may have calculated that they could step up pressure against, uh, uh, on, on Japan without triggering the involvement of the U.S. Um, rhetorically, um, diplomatically, as well as uh, militarily. The Chinese hoped that the U.S. would remain neutral and objected strongly when the Obama administration stated publicly that Article 5 of the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty covers the islands because they are under Japanese administrative control. This is a position that, of course, was first articulated by the Bush administration, was simply reiterated uh, under the present administration. And at the recent defense consultative talks in Beijing, um, a PLA general reportedly warned uh, Under Secretary of Defense Jim Miller, not to encourage Japan uh, over the islands. Uh, the general stated that the issue should not be a problem between the U.S. and China. And I think this continues to be China's strategy of trying to keep the United States out of this issue, as well as the territorial disputes in the South China Sea. We also recently saw an important statement signed um, by the United States, Australia, and Japan. Uh, which stated that um, uh, these three countries oppose any coercive or unilateral actions that could change the status quo in the East China Sea and express support for efforts to reduce tensions and prevent accidents or miscalculation. Again, the Chinese foreign ministry um, reacted rather harshly to the language used uh, in the statement. We've seen U.S.-Japan joint military exercises and activities um, uh, increase and they have drawn China's criticism 
Uh, Beijing strongly opposes, um, of course, U.S.-Japan missile defense cooperation, uh, believing that it is aimed at degrading China's nuclear deterrent, not defending against a North Korea threat. In October 2012, uh, you may recall that the U.S. and Japan canceled um, a joint drill to practice retaking a remote island uh, from foreign forces. And then Prime Minister Noda um, was reportedly fearful of angering uh, Beijing. I would note that rather than respond with a positive gesture, uh, the Chinese increased pressure uh, on Japan. And in subsequent months, we saw the, uh, the Chinese fly a Y-12 surveillance maritime aircraft close to the Senkaku Islands, which was for the first time ever, and then directed fire control radar at a Japanese helicopter and a destroyer. Now, one could argue that displays of weakness tend to be exploited by China to its advantage. A similar joint U.S.-Japan exercise was conducted uh, this year uh, off the coast of uh, California. The Chinese apparently asked the United States to cancel that exercise because it was scheduled just days after the uh, summit between President Xi and uh, Obama at Sunnylands, but the exercise uh, proceeded as planned. So I would close by agreeing with uh, Kotani-san that I think this is not just an issue of a small dispute between China and Japan over um, islands uh, in, uh, in the East China Sea. I think this is a broader test uh, that China is, uh, is, is uh, taking, um, not just against Japan, but also against the U.S.-Japan alliance. How it is managed, how it is addressed, and ultimately, if it resol is resolved, how it is resolved. Um, I think will have very profound implications for the balance of power in the region and globally going forward. Thank you. Bonnie Glazer, thank you very much. On the one hand, uh, very much the long-term thinking in China, but whether there's a long-term strategy that's being followed, it seems there's a lot of opportunism and a lot of reacting to what China's seen uh, in the environment. So we want to turn to Dr. Christopher Young, also a senior fellow at the National Defense University, um, to help think about more of the military component here, especially with China and the United States. Thank you, Patrick, and I uh, would like to thank CNAS uh, for inviting me to, to talk today. Uh, I guess one of the dilemmas from following such good speakers is that uh, a lot of what's uh, been said, some excellent points, I now have to come up with some, something new and different, uh, maybe contrarian to what everyone else has to say. But contrarian, no, because I agree with actually everything that um, the speakers who, who spoke before me had to say. I guess my job is sort of to put the military component uh, into play with regard, to, um, with regard to what's going on in the East China Sea. Um, I thought Bonnie gave an excellent description of, of the strategic rationale Beijing may be pursuing with regard to uh, the East China Sea and the Diaoyu. Um, and I guess what I will talk a little bit about now is uh, China's military modernization and how that plays into this whole, um, into this whole dynamic. Um, I think this audience is, is sophisticated enough to, to have, have noticed uh, all the elements of China's military modernization. So I, I won't go into great detail, but those elements include, uh, over the last 15 years, a, a steady development of their surface combatant capabilities. Uh, I think the average, the Chinese are putting out on an average of about maybe uh, a new surface combatant maybe once every two to three years or so, uh, similarly with their submarine capabilities. Um, you also notice uh, a steady development of their amphibious warfare capability. So the recent, not so recent, but the last few years, the, the release uh, of the news that China uh, has developed uh, a, a landing platform dock, an LPD. Um, and then the, there's the possibility of, of China also putting out uh, a number of different LHDs, which are larger deck uh, amphibious ships. Uh, of course, the, 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 the recent development of the Liaoning uh, aircraft carrier, certainly the biggest news that has happened over the last five years. Uh, China watchers have, have long suspected that China had some sort of aircraft carrier program, but it wasn't, wasn't confirmed until uh, two years ago when they announced, yes, indeed, we have an aircraft carrier capability. Uh, we, it's going to be operational by 2012, 2013, and we will be steadily developing it. And, and most China maritime watchers have been steadily watching to see uh, to see where that's going, whether or not they're, how effective their air wing is on, on the carrier, how effective their ability to manage uh, aircraft on that, on that carrier is, is developing. 
Um, so a number of different developments uh, with China's military modernization, those include the development of their aircraft. So, so 15, 20 years ago when I first started doing this, I would have said China, if, I, if you were to ask me to describe China's uh, air, for, air capabilities, I would have said, well, China's made up largely of thousands of, of, uh, of aircraft, of MiG-17, MiG-19, MiG-21 variants uh, going back, so decades behind uh, Western uh, fighter capability. But that's clearly changed now with, with the release of, of some of China's more modern aircraft. The J-10, J-11 are, are widely seen as comparable to Western aircraft capabilities, F-15, F-16 types. Um, you also see China developing a number of different other support types of aircraft, transport aircraft, uh, their own airborne early warning aircraft. So, so there's no question that China's modernization capability is, is, is uh, relentless, uh, persistent, and, and ongoing. Uh, I guess the question is now, within the context of what uh, of what has been said before, how does this now apply to uh, a Senkaku Diaoyu scenario? Um, I went back and looked at some of, my, some of my old notes from graduate school, and I took a class with, uh, with Elliot Cohen on net assessment. And, uh, and Professor Cohen um, had a specific view on that. And uh, he said, you know, net assessment is not simply numbers crunching, looking at, looking at this number of uh, assets versus that number of assets, and then just grinding them into a, into a computer program, even though having been part of the Navy staff as a civilian, I know that's what we do spend a lot of time doing, number crunching. Um, I spent enough time in the basement of the Pentagon with, with, uh, with our simulators uh, doing that kind of thing. But what you need to do is you need to sort of look at um, the different uh, scenarios to sort of see how the different countries involved might employ military capabilities in support of the strategies that Bonnie, uh, Bonnie laid out. Um, as I, as I th thought through this, I thought of three different contexts in which China might uh, might be using, uh, might use its military capabilities, its civilian capabilities as well, um, to pursue its interests. So, the first context is a, a, a battle of persistence. Um, Bonnie mentioned that uh, the Chinese are likely to be using uh, their, their China maritime surveillance and their paramilitary forces to, to challenge Japanese presence, ch challenge Japanese administrative control over, over the Sankaku. And I think that's absolutely right. So it's going to be a battle of persistence. China will be sending in naval task forces to challenge uh, J Japan's control over the area. But primarily the instrument's going to be a paramilitary one. It's going to be the use of their CMS vessels to press, to press and pressure uh, Japan. Um, you see that very clearly, that strategy very clearly being utilized in the South China Sea. Um, and it is clearly a battle of persistence. China pushing in and uh, if the if the rival claimant then responds with, with some sort of uh, coast guard or naval capability, China then ups the ante and keeps ratcheting up the pressure until, uh, until the country relents. Um, in, in the case of the South China Sea Scarborough Shoal, that was a clear pattern that uh, the Philippines would respond, China would respond with something more. China would then agree to pull back, the Philippines would pull back, China would then respond with, with greater numbers. So it's clear, clearly the case that China's playing a numbers game. It's also, you also see that with regard to aircraft, that is China will, will fly uh, its aircraft into close to Japanese territorial airspace, Japan would respond. Um, I saw a number as large as something like 160 incidents where Japan air self-defense forces had to respond. Uh, I don't know if that number is accurate, but that's what I was, was read in the open press. Um, that kind of persistent uh, persistent activity is bound to wear down one or the other. And so the first context in which we look at this is China's use of presence and, and this pressure to try and make, the, make Japan just relent, give up, uh, and essentially back off uh, and either admit that, there's going, that there is a dispute with China or just cave in with regard to negotiations. So that's the first context. Um, and the numbers aren't, are not... Um, the numbers are sobering. That is, if you look at the projected number of China maritime surveillance ships likely to, to be uh, online over the next uh, decade or so, the, we're, we're likely to have, right now, uh, Japan's Coast Guard and China's maritime surveillance force are roughly about equal, around 50 or so. Uh, China's projected to have uh, probably 20 more over the next decade to 20 years. So this isn't going away, and this isn't even factoring in, 
uh, uh, the PLA Navy. The PLA Navy has pretty much uh, in the, been in the background. So with regard to the battle of persistence, it, it, to me, the, the, the trend is, is, is worrying in that Chinese have been able to put this kind of pressure on and the number of their paramilitary forces is likely to go up, to continue to increase. The second context in which I would look at, look at the, the Senkaku Diaoyu dispute is with, with the possibility of the ability to project influence or project a political outcome. And what do I mean by that? Um, if we're talking about uh, contested islands, what, would China's, what, are, what are China's ability to either land a small force on that island, form a lodgment, and then hold it? And how would Japan respond to that? What are China's capabilities in terms of pushing Japan's uh, ground self-defense forces off of any of the, of the islets there and to hold it? And what are China's abilities to essentially create a bubble around that whole area and, and essentially protect any forces it's able to put on, the, on those islands and prevent any, anyone from coming in and intervening? Well, China's amphibious capabilities, though rudimentary, are, are certainly ongoing. So I mentioned before the landing platform dock. Um, that's a pretty significant uh, piece of hardware. Um, the U.S. Navy has its own, uh, and you can put a number, certainly put a number of, of ground troops on that and land them. Um, one LPD, of course, doesn't make an amphibious force, but if you start adding in LHDs and other uh, capabilities, the fact that the Chinese have uh, developed their own amphibious assault vehicle uh, and their own landing craft, as this goes on, China's ability to threaten that kind of act, action or activity, certainly worrying uh, to any military watcher. And if you look at Japan's ability to respond, Japan's own amphibious ass, uh, assault capability, that is to then respond to uh, an amphibious assault by China, um, you can see that Japan is, is starting to realize, at least many in the Japan self-defense forces are realizing they need that sort of capability, despite the political sensitivities to that. I, I, I certainly recognize that. But Japan needs a capability to be able to respond. So you have a, a Western army created, but you need, to, you, you need to increase the size of that force. Um, you have a f small number of amphibious assault uh, vehicles, I believe less than 10. Um, the number of landing craft that the Japanese have are very small. So, so clearly, Japan's own organic amphibious capability, in my opinion, is not sufficient to deal with some sort of counter intervention to deal with China. So Japan's cooperation with the United States is vital, but Japan also needs to develop some sort of capability to deal with that. So China's ability, um, while from a, an amphibious Navy perspective, is still rudimentary. I, I would look at this and say, well, you know, um, if China were to try and assault a wide range area, they, uh, they couldn't do it. But with regard to small numbers of islands, uh, China certainly um, is developing that capability. Um, the, a lot of, has been written on a larger conflict between Japan and China. Um, I know that uh, James Holmes has written on the subject, um, what would a war between Japan and, and China look like? And, and there's a lot of speculation as to what a larger conflict like that uh, would look like. So I'm not going to go into that because I, I think that the, I, the possibility of that is so remote, at least within the next decade, that it certainly is not helpful from my perspective to, to speculate what, what this larger conflict would look like. But I think um, if you look further down the road, 10, 20, 30 years, you, you at least need to think about China's development of its military capability and then its ability to use that capability to exert pressure on Japan for whatever reason to, to advance Beijing's interests. Um, so in that light, Japan does need to watch China's longer term military capability and then think, of, think very hard about what it needs to do in terms of a, as a response, to, as a deterrent, um, it really does need to think about that. And in, and in addition, I know we're, we're going to talk about this to a greater degree later on, um, its relationship with the United States. How does Japan and the United States complement one another to serve as a deterrent against China's uh, growing military capability? And with that, I'll, I'll stop. I know there, uh, I may have raised more questions than answered, but, but I'll stop from there, and then uh, I'll, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that might arise. Christopher, that's terrific. Uh, those three scenarios, of course, are on the minds of uh, planners in Tokyo and Washington and elsewhere in the region. And you can imagine just being worn down over time and seeing this persisting, the possibility of a sudden dislodgement exercise that would, at least the capability is going to be growing, and then the prospect in the long term of what happens if this 
did escalate into some kind of conflict. So all of those are very much tainting thinking. We're going to turn now to two uh, discussants who will be briefer in their comments before we open it up for some questions and answers. And first, I'm delighted to turn to my good friend, Paul Giara, who's a great alliance manager of uh, U.S.-Japan issues and a great strategic thinker, on, especially in the maritime space. So, Paul, over to you. Thank you, Patrick. Um, it's a, I'm as pleased to be here with my colleagues as I am challenged to keep up with them and add something to the conversation. Um, my sense is that we should give China credit for uh, meaning what it says, and then I think we have to go on then to judge uh, the outcomes of that by what China is doing. I think China's efforts to prepare for major combat with Japan and the United States, uh, starting in its desire to, um, to uh, ensure control over Taiwan, but now shifting to a very different strategic focus. Those efforts have been concerted, they've been organized, and they've been effective. Um, and I believe that their plans uh, going forward are feasible, all things being considered. And if you don't believe that China can do this, then simply look at the Soviet Navy from the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis when we undressed the Soviets to the end of the Cold War, by which time the Soviet Navy was a terrific strategic challenge to the United States. Um, I think about these issues in the context of war fighting, and I think you should too. I think we have to think about military campaigns and the implications of uh, uh, in, uh, very large terms, that is to say in large-scale conflict of what uh, Bonnie Glazer referred to as this broader test that China is imposing upon us. Uh, and my underlying philosophy is that deterrence is the best hope for peace, and that in order to be deterrent, in order to achieve a deterrent capability, one has to, and we together have to, think very, very carefully about the military components and implications and consequences uh, of China's actions, and then, as best we can, with the resources we have and with the technologies and organization and infrastructure and national power that we have to prepare to continue to deter China going forward. Now, I, I want to make one observation and go on to some specific points. Uh, and the observation is twofold. We are in the midst of Chinese, excuse me, of Japanese military normalization. This is good. It's coming late to the game, and China has forced the issue for Japan. Um, Connect that with the fact that the U.S., for many of the same reasons, is in the midst of a military revolution. And what that is really is the manifestation of the realities of half of air-sea battle concept, which is finally, at long last, to integrate U.S. military operations to the very, the very intimate level of where Air Force commanders can direct Navy weapons and vice versa. I don't know what took so long, but it's, it's hard enough, so I won't belabor the point. Now, there's been a, in the last year or two, there's been a fair amount of talk about comparing 1913 with 2013. And the implication, of course, being that before World War I, everybody expected war but nobody anticipated it. If they had, perhaps things would have turned out differently, maybe not. But the war that came swept away the European civilization for all intents and purposes. So um, the, the issue then was the, the, the competition between the crown heads of Europe, perhaps, if that, maybe that's an oversimplification. But the organizing challenge now is China's A2 AD strategy. So how do, how do we think about that? How do we prepare for military campaigns um, in the future in that context? Now, I agree with much of what was said before, but I don't agree with the fact that we can somehow dismiss or push into the future or not pay too much attention to this Chinese major combatant threat. So this is my context here. So now think about the fact that I believe we have the wherewithal to think about this. 
I also believe that we have the wherewithal to prepare for this challenge and to meet it, um, despite what we tell ourselves um, politically and in our newspapers. The question is, will we? So several considerations. Think about the campaigns that we're facing. These are not all of the campaigns, but some of them. Anti-submarine warfare, aerospace defense, um, missile defense, island defense, those kinds of campaigns. What is the common element? And I'm going I'm to wrap this up very quickly. Uh, the, and the fact that we are in a nuclear war fighting environment. And if you don't believe that, ask the Chinese. Ask the Chinese how they're preparing. And the, the fact of the matter is, unfortunately, this is a huge deficit in our preparation because we don't know how the Chinese think. We don't know what the Chinese have. We don't know the number of warheads. We don't know the number of launchers. We don't know what their doctrines are. And we don't know who to talk to to talk down from the precipice. Cyber warfare. The, the, the connection between nuclear warfare and cyber warfare is that we are so vulnerable. We are as vulnerable to cyber attack now as we were to nuclear attack in the Cold War. So what's the common element in all of this, in U.S.-Japan preparation, in jointness, effective war fighting, in ASW, in missile defense, in island defense, in nuclear war fighting, and in cyber defense is C4 ISR. We have absolutely got to underscore and develop and, and protect our C4 ISR capability because these are campaigns of maneuver, these are campaigns of integration, these are campaigns of coordination, and in fact, the first campaign is gonna be the C4 ISR campaign because the enemy who can disrupt and disintegrate your C4 ISR is going to beat you. And if you can prevent that from happening, then these other campaigns can proceed. So this is my sense of what we have to prepare for and how we have to do it, what the stakes are, and what China is telling us. As I, and I want to reiterate the very first thing I said. We should give China credit for meaning what it says. Thank you. Well, Paul, thank you very much. Uh, obviously, these are multifaceted issues, and we're coming now to kind of the pointy end of the spear of the, of the military dimensions and focusing a little more we need to hear a Japanese perspective on this from Kome Isozaki, who is uh, with the Ministry of Defense, but he's here today as a fellow at uh, this Center for Strategic and International Studies. So I hope behind that uh, confines as a civilian CSIS think tanker, um, you can tell us a little bit about Japan's white paper and sort of their defense approach toward these issues. Okay, good morning. Thank you for inviting me to a uh, fascinating event, uh, Dr. Groening and CNIS. Uh, <clears throat> First, uh, because this is on the record, I have to say that uh, the views expressed by me is not the uh, view of the Japanese government or the Ministry of Defense or the CSIS. Uh, first, I should begin, uh, I'd like to begin with uh, denying the simplistic arguments uh, I sometimes hear in Washington, uh, in which uh, Japan's nationalization of the Senkaku Islands in September 20, 2012 this provoked the East China Sea problems, or this is attempt to change the status quo. Uh, actually, this is not true. Uh, in reality, the, the challenger is, the, uh, from my point of view, uh, People's Republic of China. I mean, uh, People's Republic of China is, is trying to label Japan is uh, <coughs> reversing the post-World War II order. Uh, expressed in the San Francisco Peace Treaty, but actually it's, China is not the signatory to the San Francisco Peace Treaty. They claim it's uh, illegal and ineffective treaties. So uh, actually the challenge is not Japan. So the, <coughs> the reality of the, uh, this uh, provocation in the East China Sea is, uh, first, uh, China has uh, enacted the territorial water law that included the most of the South China Seas, uh, known as the Nine Dash Line, and also the East China Sea, including the, including the Senkak Islands. Um, <clears throat> so later, in December 2008, a Chinese maritime agency vessel entered the Japanese territorial waters surrounding Senkak Islands. 
In 2010, Chinese fishing vessel, as you know, collided with the on purpose Japanese Coast Guard ship. In March and July of 2011, uh, Chinese Maritime Surveillance Bureau ship and fishing agency ship uh, entered the Japanese territorial waters again. So these uh, increased activities in the Senkak areas, or including the South China Sea areas, uh, this is a, a significant change in, in, in this order, particularly since the 2008 Chinese activities and diplomatic statement is becoming more and more assertive. Um, I guess this uh, trend and activities uh, pushed some of the Japanese uh, peoples or politicians to have a more necessity to how to protect our territories, territorial waters. And this leads to the, perhaps, to the purchase of the, uh, the idea of purchasing the islands from the private owners by the governor of Tokyo at the time. Uh, the Japanese government has no mean, means other than purchasing themselves uh, to stop this, uh, to this uh, stop the uh, Tokyo prefecture's movement. Uh, if this alert were occurred, uh, it would have changed significantly status quo by establishing the more lighthouses or more ports for the fishing vessels, uh, <coughs> environmental activities. Uh, so to keeping the status quo and the keeping the balance is the Japan's uh, constant policies. As for the military balance, uh, many uh, panelists, uh, Dr. Yang and Pristap, uh, mentioned that uh, currently Japan has a sp superiority and uh, quality is better. And uh, China may be catching up in the next decade. But I, I think uh, the, the current challenge is not really military balance itself. The, the more difficult one is the, is the civilian vessels numbers. It's, it's, it's not really the quantity, but uh, quality, uh, but quantity matters sometimes because the the keeping up the pace of the patrols and pr increased presence is uh, produced by the number of ships. So the quality is, if we fight, if Japan and China fight, so the quality may overcome the quantity. But in terms of presence, uh, the quantity matters a lot. So this is a real challenge for Japan. So Japan is also, I guess, planning to or requesting the budget to increase the number of ships. Uh, but the Chinese space is very fast. So uh, we have to be cautious about uh, this trends, uh, how this trend will lead to a future balance of power in the East China Sea. And eventually the military balance is matters because that's the ultimate uh, deterrence as uh, uh, Mr. Jerry mentioned. So I should also mention the recent self-defense force or military establishment uh, effort. Uh, the recent 2 plus 2 joint statement, uh, which was issued October 3rd this year, noted the alliance is positioned to deal with various challenges such as coercive and destabilizing behaviors in the maritime domain and encouraged China to play a responsible and constructive role in regional stability and prosperity and to adhere to international norms of behavior. Um, so this is the policies. Uh, also, oh, as uh, Kotanisa mentioned, uh, uh, ISR capability is most important in the near future. So considering the increased danger of the near area of the Japanese uh, <coughs> near area, uh, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance activity activities are becoming important. So we need a cyberspace, uh, more jointness and uh, common uh, language, common communication system is becoming more and more important uh, in the security of Japan. The third two plus two statement also mentioned the establishment of a bilateral defense ISR working group and reaffirmed its mission of interoperability and information sharing between the US and Japanese forces. Uh, this is a this is a, a good, good effort to improve the ISRs. So, uh, so uh, also the Defense Posture Review Interim Report, uh, which is designed for new national defense program guidelines, uh, which was uh, which is supposed to 
created by the end of this year. Uh, they also mentioned in July the importance of ISR. They <coughs> pointed the necessity of uh, high altitude UAVs for persistence wide area ISR capabilities. Uh, also, uh, Ministry of Defense uh, budget request draft for fiscal year 2014 also mentioned the improvement and the acquisition of early warning aircraft, restructuring of early warning wings of Air Safety Defense Force. Also, it, request, it was requesting the upgrade and development of a new patrol aircraft of Maritime Safety Defense Force. And uh, finally, a new positioning of coastal defense and observation forces in the southwestern islands, by ground, more mainly by ground safety defense forces. Uh, in fact, the protection of remote islands, particularly those in the Okinawa Prefecture area, area was not robust for the various reasons of <laughs> history and uh, politics. Uh, so this is a significant and important step to strengthen Japan's defense capabilities. So we also have to uh, recognize that now Chinese official media has begun to claim the sovereignty over the Ryukyu itself. So not just the Senkaku, but the Ryukyu itself is a historically Chinese tributary strait uh, before the 19th century. That's a Chinese, Chinese claim. It's, a, it's not a modern international order. It's a kind of Confucian middle kingdom concept. I also want to point the connectivity to this issue to the South. China Sea or global issues. The, in, in this regional context, the two plus two statement also referred to the regional capacity building and maritime security. Uh, this, uh, the US and Japan agreed and emphasized cooperation in maritime security and counter piracy to protect the freedom of navigation and ensure safe and secure sea lines of communication and promote related customary international law and international agreements. So these uh, global uh, global commons protection idea is can be not just East China Sea, but also the global uh, <coughs> challenges for the maritime do domain. And it is also a good opportunity for Japan to go global uh, peace protectors and in international security affairs. Thank you. Isazaki-san, thank you very much. I wish we had more time, and, and we've had a great audience, and you've been very patient, but we've heard some great presentations. We do have some microphones now roving around. We'd love to take um, maybe a group of comments or quick questions uh, for the panel, if anybody would like to raise his or her hand and briefly identify yourself and uh, you could uh, address a particular panelist or, or just a general question or comment, if there's anybody. In the back, yes, sir. Uh, my name is Rich Douglas with General Electric. Uh, during the Cold War, our antagonist or our rival was the Soviet Union, the Warsaw Pact who had a very independent, you know, the Soviet Union, their economy was largely separate from, they didn't depend on the West for markets, nor did they have to go globally to get resources. China is in a very different economic situation where economically they are very uh, tied to the global economy. Could one of the panelists co uh, comment on whether uh, Chinese economic and commercial imperatives constrain their freedom of action in the security sphere in ways that the uh, Soviet Union never had to face into? Rich, thanks, a great question. Um, are there other hands that want to come up? Satu LeMay, yes please, here in the front. There's a microphone right here. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, my name is Satu LeMay, I work for the East West Center here in Washington. My question for any of the panelists who choose to answer it derives from the closing comments uh, Bonnie made, which were, um, this is a test of the US-Japan alliance and it's a long-term test, not just a small dispute over an island. So I guess anyone who'd like to answer, how are we doing on the test? How is the U.S.-Japan alliance managing this long-term structural strategic challenge? A great question. It's also appropriate for the next panel as they talk about the role of the alliance in dealing with this. Sir, would you like to add a third question, and then we'll turn to the panel. Thank you, uh, Hideki no Shito Kyodo News. Uh, my question is to Mr. Kotani-san. Uh, I agree with you on, uh, on your perspective <coughs> that uh, uh, the Senkaku Island issue is the future wager. Um, how to handle the Senkaku Daiyao you uh, rest with uh, the future wager. So, however, so 
So Mr. Glasser pointed out correctly that uh, it's very hard for us to imagine that uh, PRC cave in the Senkaku Daiaoyu. So how could you, how could we find a political solution or a diplomatic solution in the future on the Senkaku Island issue? Thank you. Well, we have three good questions, and we'll, we'll come back. Oh, Sack, no, we'll, we'll add a fourth question. That's all right. Sack Sakoto over here. This microphone right behind you. Patrick, you're too good to me. <laughs> um, in, in the context of, of uh, what uh, Satu mentioned about how are we doing when it comes to uh, this great challenge, uh, the same question but shifted over to uh, Southeast Asia and more specifically the Philippines. Um, because I think that's the, that's the same test. It's the, uh, also a part of the bigger question, and, and your your views on uh, the evaluation of how we've done there. Well, a great group of questions, and uh, starting with Rich Douglas is about the fact that China's a growing part of the global economy, and it's both constrained, but it also can use that economic power and leverage, um, but within an, a certain constraint that everybody has. And so that is affecting the test that we see in the East China Sea and in the South China Sea that Sachs Dakota just talked about. So maybe we can just go start with Jim and just go down and see which panelists would like to add anything at this point. No, I, I agree with that, Patrick. I think in terms of it's both a con the, the interconnectedness is, is both, is, is leverage, it works clearly. They can use it and, and they have used it in the past. Just looking at the way the fishing boat incident played out, uh, using economic leverage against Japan, um, does it also constrain their their, their uh, military operations? Um, at, at some level, I think it does. They have to be very careful in the way they conduct themselves. So I, I think it's um, um, I think it's a it, it's a very ambiguous situation, and I think it will continue to be so. And how they employ both instruments in terms of their economy and, and, and their military strength. In terms of the alliance, how are we doing? Well, I, I think if you look uh, at the two plus two statement, I think it was a, a real significant step forward. The bottom line, though, to my mind, is implementation is everything, and we have to see how that plays out. I think there's a great roadmap ahead. Uh, we've got to implement it. That's the key point there. In terms of the Philippines, um, certainly Scarborough Shoals came as a real um, warning in Japan as to what could lie ahead in terms of the Senkakus and, and the evolution of what was considered then, I think, in Tokyo as creeping Chinese expansionism. And uh, I think it has certainly stiffened their back in terms of the Senkakus, and I think it will continue to do so. Kotani san, and you had a question particularly addressed to you as well. <clears throat> yes, uh, so how we are responding? I think uh, we are responding uh, well. Uh, Japan has been uh, taking a very restrained response, and the uh, U.S. is now uh, understand, understanding the situation quite well. So uh, at least I think China uh, respects the, our commitment to the Senkaku. And uh, although China is sending uh, patrol boats to the, uh, in the vicinity of Senkaku almost every day, but uh, they, we now understand when they violate the territorial seas. And uh, you know, there's a certain pattern uh, behind the Chinese uh, behavior, and we clearly uh, see that China is trying to avoid any uh, incident or accident. Um, so, on, on site, we, we are now managing the situation. Uh, and the, on the diplomatic uh, arena, uh, as we know, uh, Prime Minister Abe shook hands with uh, Xi Jinping twice. Also, uh, for just, uh, it's just, it was just a greetings, but uh, it, it's a good sign. And uh, uh, there are certain uh, exchanges between the Japanese and Chinese officials and diplomats. And uh, this, this was not covered by the media, but the number one of Chinese Coast Guard and number two of Japanese Coast Guard recently met in the multilateral forum. And they also shook hands and exchanged the tokens. So, and, and uh, as we know, uh, Japanese politicians are visiting in Beijing and lots of uh, track two exchanges are, are still going. Uh, so I see we are, in, we are still in a process of finding a common ground 
Uh, although we cannot expect a short-term uh, solution, but I, I believe both Tokyo and Beijing now understand uh, we have to uh, uh, manage the situation. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, uh, we are doing uh, well. Thank you. Thank you. Bonnie Glazer. Uh, let me start by commenting on the first question. I think that China's um, uh, economic, um, uh, it's first its economic leverage and its dependence, and if you look at the situation in, in peacetime, I think that China does have uh, an advantage. There are uh, 123 countries that have China as their number one trading partner. Uh, there are a lot of countries who are very, very dependent on China. And as Jim said, uh, we have seen Chinese economic coercion, of course, not just against Japan, uh, also against the Philippines. Philippines. Um, and uh, Korea and against Norway. Uh, so, um, and uh, this is, in peacetime, I think it really does work to China's advantage. In wartime, I think it really cuts both ways. It's very difficult to say whether uh, China's dependence would, uh, how the extent to which China's de economic dependence on other countries would constrain it. Uh, to some extent, this is an issue of what kind of pain the Chinese people are willing to endure and how that affects the legitimacy of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, but there are then, the, of course, also questions about the economic dependence that other countries have on China, whether, for example, other countries would join an economic blockade. Uh, I want to very briefly uh, address uh, Sachs Sakota's questions about U.S. handling of the Philippines. I think that the Obama administration made a very good faith effort to try and uh, resolve a uh, standoff that took place in the, in the uh, Scarborough Shoal uh, with the goal of restoring the status quo ante. Um, uh, perhaps uh, the administration was naive in thinking that the Chinese would actually uh, uh, abide by an agreement that they struck. Um, and, of course, the outcome uh, was such that uh, we, we didn't predict maybe we should have uh, foreseen that the Philippines would, in good faith, uh, pull back from the Scarborough Shoal and then China would then move in and take, take it over. Um, I, I think we have learned something uh, from that experience. Um, I would hope that Japan has learned something from that experience. Um, do not negotiate any solution privately with the Chinese that you think they're going to uh, abide by. Uh, but, um, you know, we have to move forward from there. I think uh, on the, on the um, capability side, uh, the U.S. and Japan are working, I think, to increase the Philippines' situational uh, awareness so they know what's going on in their waters and they can have some uh, capability to respond to it. But that's going to take a lot of time, and I think it's still a question mark as to whether or not the Chinese are going to be able to do that uh, by themselves. But it does raise questions about um, how the Chinese look at what, how we are handling the situation in the Philippines. And if the Chinese conclude that under no situation uh, would the United States come to the Philippines' aid uh, if China continues to nibble away at uh, Philippines' interests, and the second Thomas Shoal is out there waiting to be the next crisis, um, then that, that will be problematic. Christopher Young. Um, I'd look at the economic question with a broader aperture. Um, so far, we've talked about you know, who has leverage uh, in an economic situation, but I think the fact that China is so integrated with the United States economically and globally um, certainly, I think, uh, has Beijing take pause with regard to how far they can push this. So I think what you see is a pattern of pressing, pressure, uh, pressing the country, their rival claimants, but recognizing that they don't want to press too hard because they, this could lead to a larger conflict, which could turn around and bite China. In the end, so I do think that lar uh, by and large, uh, the economic situation does constrain Beijing's options. Um, so that's my larger view on on the economics. Uh, with regard to the, the how we're doing with Japan, I think a good test of that is whenever um, NDU goes over and talks with the Chinese, they have made a relentless effort to split the two sides together. Every almost for the last year, almost every visit we've had with the PLA and with Chinese scholars has been a relentless, you realize that Japan is a problem. You realize that Japan is becoming militar, militarized. You realize, of course, that the Abe government is a problem. And, you, and we have frequently said, that's not how the United States looks at it. Um, we recognize that Japan and China has their problems. But we, we ask you, China, not to look at it in such a myopic way. So I think, um, from, just from my own anecdotal evidence, I'm seeing the Chinese relentlessly trying to split the two sides, and I don't think it's working. So from my view, um, the alliance has held firm pretty well. I think we've, been, we've, we've done pretty well 
in presenting a, a united front, and the Chinese are attempting almost at, on, every, on every front to try and break, break the two sides apart. Um, with regard to the, um, the ASEAN question, I, I, won't, I think Bonnie answered that question very well. Um, I think the Chinese have, uh, have, uh, have been pressing the United States on this issue simply because we've been so ambiguous. We were uh, ambiguous with regard to how much support we would give the Philippines. Um, but I think the, the response from the region, Vietnam coming to the United States and giving us greater cooperation, the Philippines giving us greater cooperation, there's been sort of a backlash that Beijing, I think, will be now thinking about how they respond or act in the South China Sea with a little bit more caution because the United, I think what they've seen is that a lot of the countries have come to the United States and said, help us deal with, uh, with this bullying country. And so I think the Chinese now will approach uh, the South China Sea, with a, not necessarily with more caution, but I think it's, it, it's, it's a blank slate where they're trying to see, um, well, will the United States now use the fact that there's a perception that China's bullying to, to, to encircle China? So uh, I, I think that's still an open book to see, um, to see how well we're doing. But I, uh, but I, think, we're, I, I think the countries in the region uh, and the United States have learned a big lesson from Scarborough Shoal, and so we'll see what, what happens from there. The sand is quickly emptying from the uh, hourglass here, but Paul Giara and isazaki san For the first time in a long time, I, I'm delighted to say that the four people most important to my professional life are in the same room with me. <laughs> Mike Green, Rich Douglas, Sachs Dakota, and Patrick Croner. Thank you very much for coming together. Um, that seems like a non sequitur, but when you're up here sort of wool gathering, it's certain things occur to you. Um, <laughs> Uh, thank you, Rich, for, sure. for your question. I think it's astounding that the Chinese have managed to convince us that their economy and their territory are somehow off limits in the strategic competition that they have started with us. I think that's phenomenal. More power to them. God bless them. We have convinced ourselves that there are things, there's nothing worse than having a problem in the economic relationship between Beijing and Washington. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard, certainly in the context of the sweep of history. And if we're not in an, at, an historical juncture, I don't know when we ever will be in my lifetime. As far as how the alliance is going, I think we're doing pretty well. Um, but I say that very guardedly. What's interesting in the alliance is that in many ways, the momentum has shifted to Tokyo. That is unprecedented. I'm not quite sure how that's going to play out. Um, Japan has rewritten its basic national strategy in the last several years and is pursuing what it has written. It is pursuing that plan. The United States has not done so. Um, so we'll see how that all turns out. Thank you. isuzaki san would you like to add anything? Uh, yes, uh, something. Uh, uh, as for the solutions of this problem, I don't see a best answer. Uh, but the only way uh, I can say is we should pursue the current policy that is uh, no escalation, no use of force, and we should stick to the international norms and laws. And also, in addition, uh, I didn't mention the last, last uh, statement that we need to have uh, some, some, some conflict prevention mechanisms. We need to uh, live together with these issues uh, for for some time. So uh, rather than going to the quick solution, we should uh, think about how to manage these issues. So uh, so China and Japan, uh, the defense side, almost agreed uh, last year to uh, establish a, a mechanism for for the crisis management mechanism, but it was cancelled by China. And I heard the Japanese Minister of Defense still uh, pursuing to requesting the talks, but the China uh, always answered too busy to do uh, talks. So uh, I think it's China should be more urgent to talk uh, with the Japanese counterparts to establish uh, some sort of mechanisms. As for the economy ish economic issues, I think uh, economic interdependence between China and Japan is significant. So this is a kind of a big factor that both countries will will be restrained, restrictive. And so, but we should also rem, uh, be mindful that uh, Great Britain and 
Germany before the World War I was very uh, interdependent economically, but they went to war. So we, all, we always have to be uh, prepared for, the, uh, for uh, any conflict or accidents uh, to manage the mechanism uh, and establish mechanisms for that. Jim, go ahead, just quick. Two quick points on the alliance. <clears throat> How are we doing? And building on uh, Chris's point that the Chinese uh, relentless efforts to try and split the alliance. I think the Sunny Land Summit stance is a real testimony that they're really failing when Xi Jinping brought up the issue of China, of, of uh, the, the Japan and the Senkakus. Uh, the president just cut him short. He made very clear Japan is an ally. End of the story. Uh, secondly, in terms of how are we doing, what steps can we take to strengthen the alliance, I think uh, right now we're seeing the submission of the uh, class, uh, in, uh, legislation to protect classified information into the, into the diet. I think that's a very critical step as we try and expand intelligence, C4, ISR our cooperation that that legislation goes through. Well, the, the, the good news is that um, we've heard some tremendous insights from great panelists. The bad news is we're out of time. Uh, because we've had such a, an extensive panel here, and you've been very patient. I won't try to summarize everything that's been said, but it does certainly uh, raise big issues in terms of just exactly how power is shifting, and not just the objective shift, but also the perceived shift in power is affecting policy in all of these capitals and, and beyond. Um, clearly, uh, it's a multidimensional um, challenge. Uh, and there are going to be people who are focused on the business of the region and those who are focused on the defense planning and a lot of people in between who are caught in between these dimensions and uh, they're all going to be uh, factored in. Um, the third was observation is simply that we live in a period where at least for the next uh, decade that this is largely about coercion and counter coercion uh, or even um, nibbling, if not coercion, um, it, it, intimidation. I mean, it's the spectrum, but it's, it's something short of the, the big war concerns, and yet that's lurking out there as a long-term driver of a concern. But at the same time, how the alliance is able to handle this is a critical question. We're going to hear about this from a great panel that's going to follow this. I will just add one last anecdote. Having come back from Europe, where I was describing to European foreign ministries about the rebalance to Asia with Europe. And uh, the former German ambassador to China, this was on the record so I can quote this, um, said, um, unlike the United States, Europe doesn't have the security alliance commitments and therefore the baggage, if you will, uh, that allows Europe to be truly neutral. And I was saying, well, I don't think Europe really can be truly neutral. Clearly though, the United States cannot be truly neutral. The United States policy, therefore, trying to hew to uh, objectivity over um, not getting involved in sovereignty disputes per se, but making a distinction about bad behavior and saying we all have a stake in a rules-based approach toward stopping bad behavior. So how the U.S.-Japan alliance is going to handle <laughs> this kind of challenge in the East China Sea, South China Sea, and beyond uh, is one of the huge issues that will be discussed. But please join me in thanking this tremendous panel. <laughs>